Um, so I assume almost all of you have actually written something in the Puppet language. Um, so Randall is going to be talking about the uh, usability of the Puppet DSL. And uh, if you have questions or if you have comments or concerns about it or things you hate, uh, he's probably not a bad person to talk to about it. So um, interrupt freely, I suppose, <coughs> at Randall's discretion. So I'll turn it over to him. All right, thanks. Um, so I'm not the world's loud, loudest talker. Can you hear me in the back? Yes, no, no, nothing, lots of shaking heads. Um, I'm going to keep talking while uh, MC here turns up the mic. All right, so um, <coughs> all right, I, I probably need 12. Um, so man, this space, huh? This, this building blows my mind. I know most of you have probably heard this before, but it tickles me to say it, so I'm going to, that in uh, the United States, 100 years is a long time, and in Europe, 100 miles is a long way. So this building feels like it's older than everything in Portland put together. Um, <laughs> if I thought I could get away with it, I'd have us just sit here and stare at this stained glass for an hour. Um, and now I'm actually not high. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> so I'm using this, uh, this little keynote uh, app, and that's partly because um, I'm massively sleep deprived. My body thinks it's 3 a.m. and I'm not going to remember everything. So if I'm looking at this thing, I'm not texting my wife. I'm actually just trying to remember what's in the end. Um, I'm Randall Hansen. I, uh, I've only been a puppet for three months, and this is my first um, puppet camp, so I'll give a brief bio uh, so you know who I am. Um, I started programming 25 years ago, and the first app I ever wrote was called Dad. We had this Tandy 1000, and uh, Dad was a control freak, and he had this, this, what we would today call a productivity suite or an office suite. Um, and he liked to print in this minuscule little font on this dot matrix printer. Uh, but to do that, he had to shell into QBasic every time. We booted the thing from floppy and run the half a dozen arcane commands. And if it didn't work, you didn't find out until you printed. Spent 12 minutes, you know, booting the printer and wasting paper and all this other crazy stuff. So I said, you know what, this sucks. I bet I can solve this problem. So I whipped out the QBasic manual and wrote my first program. And I remember the look on his face the first time he typed in dad and hit enter. And it ground away for a minute. And then it worked. And it worked every time. I didn't have to think about it anymore. And so I got totally hooked on... Uh, on that feeling and on what Noreen calls solving other people's problems, right? This is what I love to do. Um, also in high school, I did a lot of graphic design for print. I went to college and got a degree in English and philosophy, and naturally this segued into working at a big architecture firm as a sysadmin. And I did that for four years. Um, I started working on the web in the mid-90s and fell in love with the web, fell in love with interaction design, and I've spent 15 years doing that, uh, mostly as a consultant. So when my friend Beth, excuse me, when my friend Beth at Puppet called me and said, hey, we need a user experience guy, someone to do user experience design and maybe usability testing and design process, and hopefully this person knows a lot about software engineering and systems administration and maybe linguistics, I said, hey, I was custom built on a lab for this job by a mad scientist. Um, so. Here I am. <clears throat> so <clears throat> there are plenty of people at Puppet. There are 40. There were 40 last week. There may be more now. I expect I got back to the office and I'll see new faces. Um, but everyone has a certain list of things they care about. A number of things that they're they're trying to move forward. They're trying to um, exert influence over um, for the betterment of Puppet, for the betterment of the company. Um, and all these things are good and valid, and some of them are obvious by title and position. Sales cares about selling things. Um, people care about fit to market. They care about whether features work uh, for a particular audience. They care about what we're actually doing. Um, but the banner that I am trying to fly and have been trying to fly is user-facing quality. And I'm trying to pretend like I don't care about anything else and that this is the one thing that I keep harping on. Um, this is the thing that I care about. This is the thing that I care about the most. It's the thing that I enjoy caring about. Regardless of what we do or why we do it or how we do it, are we shipping quality product to you fine people? Um, and the answer is, yeah, a lot of the time, uh, but not always. Um, so my mom always said, this, ha, this thing is so cool. Uh, my mom always said, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Um, and in that case, this would be a brief talk 
Um, I hate to slag other people's work, especially since those people are paying me and sitting here uh, <laughs> listening to me. Um, but the fact is that uh, the puppet has problems um, and that the only way we can address these problems is to shine a clear light on them um, and understand exactly what is wrong and why it's gone wrong and try to build uh, a process and a framework around it in order to improve. So <clears throat> that's what I'm going to try to do today. Let's see if we can find things to improve. So first of all, what is user experience? Um, the, uh, the graybeards, the old school, they'd call it human-computer interaction. Uh, and the humans always came first. This is not an accident uh, because humans are the most important. And I say that I'm, I'm fully aware I'm speciesist in this regard. But hey, computers are just tools. They work for us. Um, but we can't care about everything about human beings. I love all you guys, but I don't care what you had for breakfast. I care about uh, your work in, in what I consider to be my context. And my context is our software and your use of our software. So why not call it usability, right? I mean, the talk is called usability. Um, why user experience? Usability is a little limited. Well, also the name's been taken, right? You call yourself a usability professional, people start to think about clipboards and one-way glass and testing and metrics and all that stuff, and that's an important aspect of user experience, but it's not all that user experience is. My metric is joy. Uh, I want people to look forward to using Puppet. I want people to enjoy using Puppet and to like it, not because it's perfect, not because it prevents you from making mistakes or has no bugs, but because it has a personality, because you feel like you can relate to it, because you understand it and it makes sense. And that, building a framework around that and enabling that sort of emotional connection, that's what user experience is. Is that ambitious? That's super ambitious. Um, but we've got a good start at it already. What is user experience in Puppet? The most common conversation I've had over the last three months is Puppet. Why on earth are you working at Puppet? Isn't this just servers talking to each other? Isn't this just a bunch of sysadmins on the command line? You know, what's user experience about that? Um, people, or well, a lot of my friends used to me just working on the web, but even people I don't know ask, what does user experience guy do at Puppet? Um, well, there's plenty of user experience at Puppet. Um, and the first thing I tell people is that, like a lot of you here, I've been victimized for 25 years by crappy command line tools. And now it's payback time. <clears throat> this is my revenge. Living well is the best revenge. And I tend to live well at Puppet. It has been a real pleasure for me to work on a command line tool and try to make it not suck. And even making it not suck is a high bar. Um, but to go beyond not sucking into usability and beyond that into joy, that's my goal. That's what I hope we can do. So there's the command line interface. Um, there's also the GUI. Right now our GUIs are limited to Dashboard and the Forge. Uh, Dashboard and the Forge were both launched about a year ago. Uh, Dashboard is, I think Dashboard's a 1.1.1 one, one, one now. Um, it has seen some improvements, not as much improvement as I would have liked to have seen in a year. The Forge has been pretty stale for the last year, so clearly we've got a lot of work to do with both these products. There's the DSL, the domain-specific language. And you know, while I'm here, I've said DSL a few times the last two days and gotten glassy looks from people. So who says DSL? And who says puppet language? Oh, wow. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to keep, keep saying DSL. Um, <clears throat> all right, good. That's not what I expected. Uh, but there you go. This is the first usability test that you guys have seen me do, right? My preconception was wrong. You guys are right by definition, so I'll say DSL. Um, there's the REST API, which is programmatically accessible, accessible on the command line. Um, we, have, we have a lot of work to do in the API space. Um, we've just launched the certificate API, launched, shipped the certificate API, um, which is very cool, but we've got a lot more work to do, and we're going to continue uh, improving and, and shipping new and better APIs. And then we've got the Ruby API, the internal API, where you write Ruby. Almost everything in the Ruby API ends in the .rb. You write Ruby to define resources to interact with Puppet internals. Now, I'm not going to be talking today much about the two APIs, REST and Ruby. Um, people have talked about the, the Ruby API quite a bit. I mean, Luke talked about uh, the, the guts of faces a bit. Richard Crowley had a great talk yesterday with a lot of Ruby and stuff in it. 
So mostly I'm going to be talking about the first three, and mostly I'm going to be talking about the command line. <clears throat> so let's take Mary Poppins' advice and start from the very beginning. Puppet. What happens if you type puppet on the command line? This is what you get. You get a usage message, which is uh, completely sane, and then you get this list of comma delimited available commands. So this could use some work. This could be improved. It, could, it needs some help. Um, but before we get to that, let's talk about what it does right. And let's use this discussion as a way of creating and pulling out some useful command line interaction principles, uh, ways that we can talk about this, ways that we can tell ourselves a story about this. My challenge of Puppet is that if you think of, and I don't know why this, this analogy always works for me, it's, uh, it's probably from Cryptonomicon, if you guys have read that. Um, think of software development as a train, right? It's design's job not to slow down the train. Um, this is what a lot of Agile teams really freak out about. Oh no, we're hiring a designer. Everything's gonna take four times as long because he's gotta spend a week in Photoshop and make everything perfect and beautiful. Um, it's my job as a designer to grease the rails, make the train go faster. Um, and also to run alongside it and polish the brass work when possible. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> immediate feedback. That's the first thing. And that's the first thing we get typing puppet. Right away, boom, we get something, we see something. This is important. Uh, Jacob Nielsen says that in order for something to be really feel interactive to a human being, it must respond within a tenth of a second. Now this is a high bar for the web where Nielsen does a lot of his work. Even a lot of Ajax applications don't do this. I use Google Mail at work and uh, a tenth of a second would be, would be a walk through the park um, with Google Mail. Um, but most command line tools do pretty well in this regard, and Puppet also does pretty well in this regard. <clears throat> but not everything. I was installing Statler uh, on Ubuntu. Statler's a 2.7 release. Um, Statler's the name of a Muppet. And if you guys wonder why we release slowly, it's the Muppets. Every time we release, we have to name it after a Muppet, and we have to kill the Muppet. So <clears throat> it's just ugly. They scream. Um, so I'm installing Statler. I get a raft of errors, uh, and I asked Nigel because he knows everything. And he says, oh yeah, here's that error, and here's why. Um, and here's what you type to fix it. Puppet master make users. Uh, so I type puppet master make users, and hit enter, and this is what I get, crickets. I see absolutely nothing. Now, I know why I get nothing, and I ask Nigel, hey, what the hell? And he says, oh, it worked. You just need to background this process, or go to another terminal and type id puppet to make sure that make users actually created users and groups. Uh, this is terrible. This isn't... Um, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world. It's not mining coal in China. Um, but nonetheless, in an error-prone process, in a process that has as recently as 30 seconds before I type this command proven itself to be buggy and unreliable, this command should produce immediate effect. And if that means that the make users option to puppet master uh, does not demonize the process, just creates users, so be it. If that means that uh, the make users option needs to hang off another command or be its own dedicated command, uh, so be it. But this, we have to tell people right away when something works. Another principle, uh, which we are now using, only one command. Um, this makes me really happy. And one of the happiest things about it for me is that I had nothing to do with it. Um, those of you who are still using 2.4 and 2.5, um, you're in the world using Puppet D and Puppet Master D and other applications like that. Uh, but you've probably seen this interaction pattern. You've probably heard about it in the last couple days or, or maybe in the last, I don't know, four years since we released 2.6, um, that we now hang everything off Puppet. Um, <clears throat> this is new school. This is not old school. This is, uh, ha, I was wondering where Jeff was getting those photos. Um, <clears throat> Git has been one of the big purveyors of this, uh, this subcommand interaction pattern. Uh, they're not the first, but how many of you have used git? Yeah, right on. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. You type git, and then everything hangs off git. Um, not in the most coherent way, always, but at least you start from a single place. Not everybody does this. The old school guys don't really do this. If you look at SSH, you've got the SSH command, and then just on stock OS 10, you've got five other SSH commands. SSH add, SSH keygen, SSH key path. I don't even know what all of them are. Um, and some of these things take a very few options. Some of these things take a whole boatload of options. Um, 
but your only hope is tab completion at this point, SSH tab, and read through the list. Oh my God, what am I going to use? Um, but with Puppet, what I want for Puppet is for everything to hang off one command. That if you only know one thing in Puppet, you just know the name of the software that at least you can get on board, at least you can start using it, at least it starts making sense to you. So, what does this do today in Statler, in Statler RC1? Boom, a wall of text. Um, so I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh my God, a wall of text on the command line. But you know what? I think I can convince you that this is useful, and if not, I'll change my mind. Um, so there are a few problems with this, but what it does give you is a very, very clear path forward. Um, and this exposes another principle, which is helpful by default. Um, if you type puppet in a subcommand world, you, if you type puppet and hit enter and expect something to happen, you are a little lost. And it's not a value judgment, it's just the truth. Um, in a subcommand world, puppet doesn't do anything, puppet can't do anything. And so what we assume you've done is typed puppet help. And we give you four things. We give you a quick usage message. Um, and after that, we give you a list of subcommands and a list of available applications. Now, this, this is something that I'm frankly not convinced I'm right about. Um, but let me tell you why we're doing it. First of all, applications, almost all the applications that are available here have been available uh, in 2.6. And so you're going to see a list of familiar applications that you've seen before and that you've interacted with before. Um, faces are all brand new. And we've got, uh, I don't know, 16. We've got nearly 20 faces. Um, and so seeing all those things in a group, I like because we interact with them in the same way. Uh, the applications don't even have consistent interaction between each other, never mind with the faces. Um, the other reason for this is we're trying to tell people a story. By people, of course, I mean you, that we have faces, we have this new API, and we are bound and determined to move every puppet command line interaction into faces. Uh, 2.7, uh, this is not going to happen. Um, hopefully by 2.8, Telly, another Muppet down the drain, um, this will happen. And all these applications will be legacy. They will all be done with faces. They will all work the same way. Um, and then the last thing you see is help, um, telling you explicitly how to get help. Um, now, the cool thing about this is that help is a face. How awesome is that, right? It's a face that introspects other faces. Um, and then you see one of the last things there is a, a man face. Now, we don't actually have that, and that's not gender, right? It's, it's, it's man, it's manual page. Um, we don't actually have that implemented yet, so either we're going to implement that as a, an RC introduced bug, Nigel's cringing, or <laughs> we're, um, we're just going to take that out of the documentation until we actually launch the thing. So what man will do is give you more or less what you see today is a manual page but again, this will, for the faces, this will all be introspected from uh, data in the faces, uh, and it will output to your pager, as God intended, not outputting on the terminal like it does today. And then the last thing is the Puppet version. Um, <clears throat> but we not, don't want to be too helpful. I have once heard Microsoft Word described as a friendly, retarded giant standing helpfully between you and your work. And and that's not what we want to do. Um, if every time you made a typo in Puppet, if every time you did something unexpected, you saw this, you'd start to hate me and you'd mail me bags of flaming dog poop and I would deserve them. Um, so in this case, if you type Puppet Foo, we assume that you're actually trying to get work done. You, you might be typing Foo, you might be typing Puppet Cert, uh, you might typo Cert and type Surf. Um, we don't know, we're not yet trying to do the magical Git uh, hey, did you mean this command here? Um, Clippy is going to be the next thing those guys do. Um, but we assume you're trying to get work done, and we don't want to harsh your mellow. And so we say, we give you the simplest error message we possibly can, right? The absolute fewest number of characters. Error. We don't know this command. Here's how you use Puppet. And if you really, really want to know more, type Puppet help. Um, <clears throat> This gives us another principle, which is scannable output. Um, when you see output from Puppet, you should be able to look at it uh, and take it in as rapidly as possible. Um, and in the old way, 
With 2.6, you get this common delimited list. If we did nothing but change this to a longer list of items, that would make it more usable. And objectively so. I don't know if you guys remember, a few years ago on the interweb, somebody had done some research about how people read and how words are spelled. And they discovered that when we read, we look at the first character of the word, and we look at the last character of the word, and then we kind of zoom in on the characters inside. And it doesn't really matter. I'm saying characters. Jesus, am I a geek or what? Letters. It doesn't really matter if the letters inside are jumbled up or not. Um, and people immediately started proving this, right? I think the first implementation was in Perl, because Perl does this by default, um, <laughs> that it would take a long passage of text and just run it through this jumbler. And as long as the first and the last letters were the same, you could still read it at something like 80% normal speed, which is really remarkable. If you start taking off the last letter, you start moving the last letter around, reading speed drops way down. You start moving the first letter around, it evaporates entirely. Um, but why this works is that you see the word boundaries on either side. You see the spaces, and you can scan the first and the last letter. And just from the first and the last letter and the length of the word, you can make a serious judgment about what the word probably is. So scannable output. This is not the be all end all of scannable output. By scannable output, I don't mean just a list of commands. I mean output that is formatted in a way that makes sense and is readable and addressable. Um, this is the first thing we have done uh, explicitly with this idea. There's other output in Puppet that is scannable, um, and we're going to try to get better at this. <clears throat> um, I have an English degree, and I die inside a bit every time I verb a noun. Um, Shakespeare is known for this, of course, but I'm not the bard. I don't carry a poetic license. But I really like actionable. I really like that word. And I particularly like it in this context. Um, because puppet error messages are legendary. We have pet error messages in the office. What's that SSH error? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so we'll fix this at some point once we can code dive far enough into the C library. Um, but I heard about puppet error messages months before I joined the company. Um, and this, this is exactly what not to do on an, with an error message. This is the thing that I saw before uh, trying to install Statler on Ubuntu, and it's just epic. You get info, error, notice, warning, error, 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 and then you get, oh, here's another roll-up of all these errors that we have just seen. What has gone wrong here, and the only thing that's really gone wrong, is that we're missing a group. So what we should be telling people is, we couldn't find a group. Um, <clears throat> and if you want to know more, try help. Now, this requires us to do more spelunking at the output. Right, because right now, you type this command, and you get the output from each of the little bits of code that this command tries to run. And certainly, this is better than no output at all, but it's not actionable. You can't scan this and really understand what's going on. Um, this is harder for us to do. Patches accepted. Um, but as Larry Wall said, if programming were easy, we wouldn't need human beings to do it. <clears throat> Option handling. Um, this is something that we thought about a fair amount. Uh, it felt like there's, a, there's an open ticket. Actually, I think the ticket is closed at this point. We were talking about, are we going to use GNU-style options or POSIX-style options? And in the end, we pretty much decided on the worst of both worlds. Um, but, and, but I'll tell you why. So here's the reason. Um, there are a lot of global options to Puppet when you write a new face and expose it as a subcommand, you can pass, you can set options for that face. And you can also set options for individual actions in that face. And so we need a way to express that. We need a way to talk about that on the command line. And the one use case that we absolutely must always support is a global option at the end, no op. Right? No op is one of the great things about Puppet, I think just from a, a CLI usability stance, it's one of the best things we've got. Um, that you don't know what something's going to do, you don't want it to hose your system, put no op at the end of it. If you copy a, a command from the email list or IRC, um, put no op at the end of it. And if we decided, you know what, we're gonna go on full POSIX options and put global options right after Puppet, you get to scroll back uh, through, I don't know, however many characters you got, put no op in the right place, hope that it doesn't fall over. 
Um, so we have to have global options at the end, which means that you can right shift options. Um, you can't left shift options, though, and I haven't even shown this up here because I don't want people to get tempted. Um, it doesn't make any sense to take an action option and pass it to Puppet. The only way for that to work is for us to explicitly scan every single face every time you work on the command line to try to find out what's going on. That'd be bad. Um, nouns and verbs. <sighs> We've talked a lot about this. Um, and if you're talking about this in English, puppet list faces is probably the way you would talk about it. I want to list the available faces. <clears throat> this is the type of thing that smart people can burn a ridiculous, ridiculous amount of time arguing about. Um, <laughs> And in fact, we have. I was, I was eating a burrito in the park, one of the first nice days in Portland, the first time I'd seen the sun in like 70 days, right? Sitting out in the sun, chilling, eating a burrito. Luke walks by and said, hey, I know we just shipped our sea today, but you know, this whole noun, verb, verb, noun thing is really blowing my mind, and, and I think we should reconsider it. Um, so honestly, this keeps me awake at night. I think, am I, are we doing something catastrophically wrong by going puppet, noun, verb, um, when puppet, verb, noun reads so well? Uh, and I don't think so, and I don't think so for a couple of reasons. One, because puppet verb noun is just fantastically difficult to implement, and we've got to ship faces. Um, and the other reason is that I think the, the specificity is a nice way of looking at it. So you've got the puppet command, you've got a subcommand, um, and then you've got an action that directly relates to that command. But as all things with regard to um, interaction, I am not the customer here, I'm not the client, you guys are. So if you've got the RC, check this out and see how it feels. Um, if you don't have the RC, get it and start playing around with it because it's really cool. <clears throat> um, let me know, I'm gonna be doing more testing of this. I'm gonna be very soon getting a, uh, um, getting a remote testing environment set up for command line interaction. And I don't know anyone who's done this, nor really any design patterns around how to do it. Uh, luckily, we're in the systems automation space, so it should be pretty easy to set up and tear this down. So what I hope to do um, is be able to test things like this with willing victims like yourself in real time, actually watch on the command line how you're using these things. Um, but in the meantime, what I've got is, is direct feedback. So use faces, give us direct feedback. <clears throat> so, if we're talking about default behavior, let's step back a bit and talk about what faces really are. And I think of faces as bricks. And as a brick is uh, simple and unsurprising. If you look at a brick, there's nothing else you need to learn about it, really. To do your fundamental things with a brick, to put this building together, every brick is the same. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, jet lag. Um, <clears throat> Since this stuff is new, these faces are new, we want it to be, we particularly want it to be unsurprising. Um, and so for the low level faces, the, uh, the things that are directly manipulating um, objects or, or parts of the model within Puppet, um, we want no default behavior. If you type Puppet Catalog, it should do nothing. It should not even do a no op. It should just tell you, sorry, Puppet Catalog requires an action. Um, and we should do this pretty consistently. Um, as you start building high level faces and as we start shipping higher level faces like Puppet Agent, you'll see in the, uh, uh, if you do a faces list right now, one of the ones you'll see is Secret Agent. And Secret Agent is our not very secret replacement for the Puppet Agent application. Um, we wanted to get the first parts of it out in the world so people can start kicking the tires. Luke talked about this a lot more yesterday about how Puppet Agent is decomposable into other faces. So those low level faces that build up Puppet Agent, those things should have no default behavior. Uh, Puppet Agent itself can and should have default behavior. It's a higher level face. You type Puppet Agent and it'll do something for you. Um, but for the most part, things should act as if you've passed them a help flag. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I've already said this a few minutes ago, but I'm gonna say it again. Um, faces are shipping in 2.7, they're the future. Uh, there are going to be some rough edges when we first ship them. Um, 
I know we don't have the greatest track record in the world of getting a, uh, a .o release out the door, being stable and shiny. Uh, Nigel was telling me a while ago the history of this, and, and as far as he knows, with every thing we've released, we've gotten better at having uh, uh, an RC, what am I trying to say here? We've gotten better at having fewer RCs and having dot releases um, being more and more stable. So we're gonna try to do that, but faces are big, and they're actually bigger from a user-facing perspective than they are from a code perspective. Um, as we've been saying, it's not about writing a bunch of new functionality with faces, it's about exposing functionality that already exists, um, but trying to expose it in a way uh, that makes a whole lot of sense all by itself. So <clears throat> faces in 2.7, um, hopefully replacing all of the applications by 2.8. So while we're here, um, how many people use Bash? Z shell? CSH? Anything else I'm missing? Easy right on. <clears throat> All right, so the vast majority of people are using Bash. Um, this is something I would really like to do in the near future is ship um, either a face or a tool which will examine your local faces and compile Bash completion for your local environment. Um, this, uh, and I'm happy that most people use Bash because that's what I understand and that's how I know, what I know how to do. So I think it would be pretty sweet if rather than having to use the, uh, the help face, if you had some idea of what was going on, you could just use bash completion and get a list of available actions per face. So I'll talk about this more in the puppet users list, uh, but that's coming, that's coming soon. So that's the CLI, let me back up. Um, ha, we're doing better in time than I thought. Um, talk to me about the CLI. Any questions so far about any of this? This list is not this list is not complete. This list of, of interaction principles is uh, a pretty good first stab at it for being a relatively a relative newbie to Puppet. Um, I've got a document that I'll be exposing publicly very soon, um, and I'm going to keep building this because, well, because <clears throat> I want people to be able to make decisions about this without me. All right. A puppet shell, is that what you're asking about? Yeah, that's something that um, when, when Luke and I were interviewing uh, back in January, I think it's something we started talking about. And I know Luke's been thinking about it a lot as well. And I really like the idea of having a puppet shell. Um, part of one of the things that we would get from a puppet shell if we did it right is good management of ad hoc changes. That is, you can log into a server, um, use the Puppet shell, and that would directly talk back to uh, the master. It would munge your manifest, so you wouldn't have to worry about making a single local change and having that blown away by the next Puppet run. There are a lot of other things that you would get, I think, with a well-implemented Puppet shell. So it's on the list, it's not on the roadmap. Uh, I think it would, yeah, I think it would be fantastic. All right, so let's talk about the GUI. Um, dashboard. Dashboard, uh, dashboard does two things right now. Um, it's a reporting front end, a reporting interface, and it's an external node classifier. Who here uses an ENC? Yeah, who uses dashboard for reporting? Yeah, not very many. All right, um, and I don't blame you, honestly. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff about dashboard, but dashboard has not been moving very fast, and we don't have Hell, who uses Foreman? Almost the same number. Um, so I don't have anything against Foreman or no plans for world domination or, or, or to crush Foreman or duplicate what Foreman is doing. Um, but right now, there are two things I really want Dashboard to do very well, and that is reporting and external node classification. Um, and reporting Dashboard does okay as long as you don't have a whole lot of nodes. Right? And if you've got a whole lot of nodes, if you've got, say, 3,000 nodes, um, working with or 30,000, boy, that would just knock it right over. If you have 3,000 nodes, you see a list, and you see 20 nodes on the first page, and you see a next button, and you hit next. Um, or if you remember exactly the name of your node, you can search for it and hope that it comes back. Um, this is bad, this is wrong. Uh, and so one of the first things we're trying to do with Dashboard is just give you a simple view of what's actually going on right now this very minute. Um, 
what nodes have failed, what nodes are pending. By pending, in this case, what we mean by pending is one of two things. That is, um, you have done a no-op run and something would have changed had you actually done an enforce run or an apply run. Um, or you've done an apply run and one or more resources is marked as no-op and it would have changed had it not been no-op. Um, <clears throat> unresponsive, compliant. So this is the, the first stab at doing in dashboard um, what I'd like to do with even more of it, which is have it stop showing data and have it start showing information. Edward Tufte says that if you think you have a data display problem, probably what it means is you don't have enough data, not that you have too much. Uh, and so luckily, this is the sea we're swimming in with dashboard. We have what appears to be too much data, but that just makes it a more interesting design problem. So this is the very, very first start at this. We hope to ship this in May. <clears throat> and there's the forge. Um, how many people use the forge? Waha. Yeah, I, stack hammer. Um, so uh, <clears throat> Geppetto, Geppetto is awesome. Geppetto's not Vim. I bet in like four man years I could totally re-implement Geppetto in Vim script. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, I just, I, mean, I hate Vim script. Um, <clears throat> The, the next thing we want to do for the Forge, the number one thing for the Forge, uh, is Git integration. I want to remove features from the Forge. I want the Forge to stop managing packages explicitly. And we hope to work with the CloudSmith guys to do this. That would make their lives easier, uh, as well as our lives. But imagine if you just logged into the Forge and pointed it to a tag on GitHub. Right? Use GitHub what it's good for. Use GitHub to store code. Don't mess around with uploading things directly to the Forge. The high-level goal for the Forge, the long-term goal, is to allow the cream to rise to the top. There's some cool things you can do with the Forge right now, with the Puppet Module tool. Um, you can search for Puppet Labs using the Puppet Module tool, and you'll see everything the Puppet Labs has put out. Um, and this is a nice sort of ego-stroking thing for us, but it doesn't really help you if what you want to know is, what's the best SSH module in the Forge? We have no way of talking about that right now. We have no way of telling you. Um, and that's what the Forge should be doing. The Forge should be a place where people who are just starting to use Puppet, starting to kick the tires, can go directly to the Forge, find uh, uh, either a best-in-class implementation of something or the simplest implementation of something, download it and get it working locally very simply. <clears throat> ah, all right, the DSL. Um, there are two things about the DSL that I'm going to talk about. And the first thing is that it's required, that it's almost impossible to do non-trivial work in Puppet without writing uh, Puppet DSL, and I think that would be a good thing to change. If we could get to the point where you can download a module from the Forge and set up a data definition somewhere else that that module can talk to, you don't have to write a module. You don't have to write a manifest. You don't have to know how it works. Now, I realize this is really airy-fairy, and um, a lot of you are thinking, ha, that'll never work, but you know what? It's a good challenge, it's a good goal to have. You know, can you use Puppet non-trivially? Can you do real work in Puppet without writing a single line of the Puppet DSL or even understanding how it works? I think it's a great goal. Um, and the second thing, everybody's favorite, the spaceship operator. Um, now I like this because it makes me feel like I'm back in the 80s plugging quarters into asteroids, right? <laughs> um, but it's, uh, I was talking with Luke a couple days ago, downstairs, way downstairs, in the vault. Um, and someone was saying that Perl is a write-only language. And Luke said, yeah, well, Python's a read-only language. Um, and so we don't want to turn the Puppet DSL into that. We don't want to turn the Puppet DSL into something that is so explicit um, that there's only one way to do things and that you have to uh, brute force hammer out code for it. One of the things that, that I tell people about Puppet, which is, on the one hand, kind of makes me nervous, but on the other hand, it's super cool, is that we have bugs in Puppet, but we have these, these fantastic professional services guys who go out on a client's site and say, all right, you've tried to do this thing, and it's fell over and burst into flames, so you know what, I'll try it this other way. Oh, now there's a bug that other way. All right, I'll try it this third way, and hey, you know what, that third way works. 
So we've got a big complicated product, but that makes it very easy to find your own twisty path in your own environment. Um, but this is a particularly twisty path, and this is much more write only than read only. Um, I don't have a solution for this. Uh, we talked about it yesterday in the Improving the Puppet DSL talk. I'm going to be filing a, uh, either a bug or feature ticket for it, depending on how cranky I am at the time, and sending it off to Puppet users. So if this bites you, or if there are particular parts of um, the Puppet DSL that seem a little more magical than you would like, uh, please engage. This is, I think, the worst thing about Puppet. Um, this is a screenshot from, I don't know, 2 a.m. Uh, 2 a.m. Amsterdam time of our Redmine system, our public bug tracker. And this is for all Puppet projects, not just Puppet itself. Um, dashboard, commercial edition. Um, we have something like 7,300 issues total in Puppet. Uh, nearly 1,800, over 1,800 of those are open. Um, and it doesn't mean they're not addressed, but it means that particularly for features, we're not making a decision about them. Um, a feature is, a feature request, a feature ticket is a gift, and it's very often a gift from the community. It's somebody saying, wow, this would really make my life better. Um, this is something that will cause me to engage with Puppet. This is something that will cause me to use it, or to evangelize it, or to tell a friend about it. Um, we need to be better about engaging directly with feature requests and either putting them on a roadmap or just saying, no, I'm sorry, this is not something we're interested in doing. Or maybe it's so far in the future that it doesn't matter. We're not going to talk about it right now. We're just going to shut it down. The bugs, the, this bug number has been going up uh, since I've been a puppet. And <clears throat> there's no way that we can just stop development um, and fix bugs for a while. This is a crazy, fast-moving space. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of tremendously cool work to do, like faces. Wow, I'd rather ship faces and fix bugs. I mean, who wouldn't, right? Um, but we have to have a way of addressing this. And we have to have a way of talking about it and saying, wow, you know what? This really sucks. It's not acceptable. Even if we apply a really brutal culling algorithm to this and assume that 90% of the people who submitted a bug were on drugs and half of the rest of them are edge cases that don't make any sense, that's still a large number. And it's still a number that matters. Um, and it's still a number that directly impinges on broken record user-facing quality, the thing that I care about. <clears throat> so why does any of this stuff matter? Um, the thing about having primarily systems administrators as an audience is uh, we can do basically anything to you guys. And you're like, hey, that's another command to memorize, whatever. Um, <clears throat> but that's not an excuse, right? I mean, we're all good at this. None of us would be worth a damn in this job if we didn't have short-term memory the size of God. Um, but it's not about questioning what we do. It's not about questioning what you do for a living or questioning your ability to memorize a whole series of crazy arcane commands. It's about us at Puppet uh, and Puppet the software, about it doing the right thing, about it being uh, a useful uh, and joyful experience. And so the question is, can we make a command line tool and a suite of applications throughout a command line tool that is actually a pleasure to use, that is actually joyful? And uh, my answer is yes. <clears throat> so what I think about using Luke's deck is that I look very professional. Um, ooh, the lights. OK, well, that's good. You can't see my face. You can see River's face. And these are his feet. <clears throat> so that's it. That's what I've got. Questions? I hear that. Hand up for error messages, priority. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I always get bugged when people don't do that. What he was saying is that um, in terms of priority for all the things that I talked about, the thing that uh, he cares about the most is useful error messages. And so my question to everybody else was, who else cares the most about useful error messages, actionable error messages? All right, that is a massive vote. <clears throat> all right.
I'm sorry, there, there's one word that you're saying that I'm, I'm not understanding. Can you say it again? Yes. Yeah, that is a good idea. It's, um, that's not something that I had, um, this, there I go again. <laughs> Sorry, jet lag, that's my, that's my excuse. Um, what he was saying is, hey, Randall, you're an idiot. Um, this, uh, <laughs> no, it's true, it's totally true, because the, the, uh, the installation, the Puppet Master um, command that I ran had verbose right there in the command line. So of course you want to see all the output with a verbose flag, duh, I should have edited that out before I took the screenshot. Um, so maybe, the, uh, maybe without the verbose flag, that's a much better error message and is less scary. Um, but your point is that with a verbose flag, yeah, you want to see everything. And without a verbose flag, you want to see as little as possible, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so what I'm hearing from this gentleman is, um, don't give us a, a, a Windows-style dialog box that says, ha you're screwed, click OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that as we produce actionable error messages, actionable does not mean um, <laughs> click OK and cry, right? <laughs> actionable, actionable means here is the, the best that we can do to tell you exactly where this is falling over and exactly what you can do next to fix it. Yeah, that's totally valid. Um, what he's talking about is, is performance. And it's the kind of thing that, that you often see in a, a backlog or a bug burn down where something will stay at position number six for months as everything keeps getting prioritized over it. Oh, this is always the sixth most important bug. It's going to stay in this spot forever while things get put above it. And performance is often that sort of thing. Oh, yeah, performance is nice, but it's not crashing. Or performance is a nice idea, but we've got these other things to do first. Um, it's a big deal, and it's a really big deal, especially as you get uh, more uh, and more things under management. Um, something that we're, we're doing right now, Dom, our, uh, our QA engineer, who's fantastic, and I'm sad that he isn't here, um, is working on profiling Puppet uh, and profiling it in various configurations, because it's something we really need to do, I think, is present you with a document of um, how to use Puppet and how to scale. Right? Use this configuration for 50 nodes. It's going to start to fall over to 150 nodes. At that point, you need this configuration, which will work up to 500 nodes. That'll start to fall over here. And it should be a matter of, of complexity. Right? Here's a trivial way to get, to get ramped up with 50 nodes. Here's a more complex way to get up to 5,000 nodes. You want to get to 30,000 nodes? Well, you can do it, but here's this you know, Byzantine way of addressing it. Um, who, who is bothered by Puppet's performance? Who thinks, wow, this is slow? All right. That's a lot of people. <clears throat> um, how many, uh, for the people who raised your hands, um, how many nodes do you have under management? Just yell out. So I'm, so I'm hearing from 100 to 35,000. So it seems like it's constant, right? Like, like even at low numbers, performance bothers people.
Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. That's totally true. Something that I don't know if you guys have, have Nigel, have you talked about the solutions group? All right. So Jeff, who was up there taking photos, and I don't know where he is now, and Dan, our, our professionals, am I treading on your toes talking about this? All right. Awesome. Um, our, our PS guys, they've been running around the world um, being a, a I don't know, warriors at large, ambassadors for puppets solving problems and, and touching down in Portland like an airplane once a month. Um, so I remember what they look like. And these guys are, are fantastic. Um, and we have pulled them out of professional services and they're gonna be wrapping up their PS work soon and working with me and Nigel in product in what we're calling a solutions group. Um, and this is the type of thing that we wanna do in the solutions group, um, hopefully build a lot of faces, but also work on problems that are a little orthogonal to what R&D works on on a daily basis. Um, so there are two parts to the performance issue. One part is, is us being better about documenting what works in what context and what doesn't work uh, and where you need to, to, you know, to up your game and, and to up your complexity. Um, and the second thing is something that Luke talked about when I'd been a puppet for maybe two or three weeks and I have no way of, of talking about how to understand this, but people have pretty good plans for scaling Puppet non-trivially, for dramatically increasing our capacity and our throughput by reducing the number of times that the agent and the master need to communicate with each other. So we don't have that, um, or maybe we do have that on the roadmap, uh, but we certainly have very good plans for it, and it's certainly something that matters to us very much. Yes, yeah, absolutely. The DSL is user experience. Um, I have spent less time with the DSL than the CLI and the GUI over the last three months, but it's something that matters to me very much. It's, it's a language, right? That's one of, I, I slagged on Perl earlier, but that's one of my favorite things about Perl. It's the only programming language that actually felt like a real language to me. Um, and the DSL isn't Turing complete, but it's where a lot of people do a ter tremendous amount of their work. Um, it does need to be improved. It does need to be made more, um, understandable and useful. Um, if you've got uh, explicit um, suggestions or even things that bug you, let me know. Um, and we'll either create a ticket or uh, get a ticket prioritized higher. <clears throat> So, so what I'm hearing is um, uh, he's asking about an interactive way of uh, of dealing with Puppet and dealing with resource changes. Um, that you can tell Puppet, hey, do a no-op run and tell me everything you would change, and then you can do an enforce run and tell to change everything, but there's no middle ground that doesn't require a tremendous amount of work. And that a useful middle ground might be, um, all right, ask me about these changes or about these types of changes and whether um, I should apply those and do that interactively. Is that correct? Is that what you're asking? Um, yeah, the Puppet, if... Uh, <laughs> We've, uh, we've made the Puppet Shell an impossible project already. It's already like a two-year project just from talking this afternoon. Um, but
but <clears throat> so to answer your question directly, no, it's not something that I'd considered before. It's not something that I that I'd heard from people. How many people think that would be cool? Yeah. 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 No. So I hear that. That's that's real. That's that's a good use case. Um, let me. I'm gonna write it down now because I'm not going to remember. Um, the other thing that I haven't talked about with, with Dashboard, there are a couple things that are, are very high on our list to do. Um, one is role-based access control. Right now, if you want role-based access control in Dashboard, good luck. You're doing a lot of HTTP auth munging and that kind of sucks. That is old school. Um, and what we're hoping to do is, is make it pluggable. So you can plug in LDAP, you can plug in Kerberos and some of these things are, are, are going to be open source. It's all going to be a, a well, we'll see. Our back. That's the basic idea. The other thing is um, certificate management. Um, in my perfect world, uh, at two in the afternoon, you get a page and it says, hey, a new uh, node came online and it needs a certificate signed. Um, and you log into the dashboard on your phone and you say, yeah, sign the certificate. I think that would be very cool. What else? Yeah, that's, that's very important. I would really love to do that. I would love it if, if Dashboard were, were a smaller, leaner application, which had, I mean, even if it had a fraction of the pluggability of Puppet, it would still be best in class for this tool set. We have now very, very limited um, plugin capabilities for Dashboard. They work for, for the one use case that we have. Um, a good plugin system for Dashboard is not more important to us than several other things like good reporting or removing some of the tremendously punishing interactions from the ENC. Um, but yeah, that is, uh, it is explicitly on the roadmap. It's very important. Yeah, we had a good conversation about this yesterday afternoon about what do you do if you, you set up a, a thousand five-year certificates four years ago? Um, you have to log into each one of those nodes one at a time and change your certificate. Does anyone actually have a real answer for this? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so I saw on, on the Puppet users list, uh, I think last night recently someone said, why don't you just set them for 100 years? Like, yeah, but that's not going to help today. That's not going to help for the next time. I need to renew them. Um, and we came up with, with what I thought was really an impressive list of, of hacks to get around this. Well, you set up a temporary secondary CA and you do this and you, and you jump through this flaming hoop. And, but what you really need is a renew command. I want to renew this certificate and I want to renew it for this expiration time. And I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how to do that, but it is on my list. <clears throat> All right, so it's 12.30. Unless uh, anyone's got anything else, we should go and eat. All right, thank you. This has been fantastic. I'm, I'm happy to be here and meet all of you. <clears throat>